Shall we talk about giant towers made from living worms? <laughs> Thought you'd never ask. <laughs> this is a story about the most numerous animal on the planet, the nematode worm C. elegans. Yeah, um, so the, the factoid about C. elegans is if you remove all dead organic matter in the world, like say you could vanish away all the structure of this studio, um, you would still see a shadowy outline of it made by the worms everything Pre- there are so many here c- crawling worms. with worms yeah. it's it's <laughs> at once amazing and disgusting uh, yeah. <laughs> other stats for every human on the planet there are apparently 60 billion nematodes <laughs> but that isn't what this story is about it's about a newly discovered emergent behavior shown by these worms individual c elegans worms are only about a millimeter long but they can form mega structures when they're trying to get somewhere yeah the, this is about the rise of the worm um, and I, I think of it as a hyper worm these worms <laughs> form together um, nice. and they can form towers uh, or, or tentacles that straddle large gaps um, you know or, or they can reach out to a passing animal and, and get on it wow. and there's an incredible video of this so it's a bit like it's making me think of ants forming like living bridges yeah. when they're trying to get somewhere in the forest it is it is um, the videos are well worth looking at I saw this a couple of years ago and you know it is amazing what these millimetre long things mm. are able to do collectively. I spoke with Serena Ding at the Max Planck Institute of Animal Behaviour in Germany about these worms, right? Um, I mean, the, the hyperworm forms this tentacle or tower, mm. but, but I asked her, like, how is it coordinated? Is it random or is it, you know, is it like a murmuration that you get in birds? Mm. Or is it like a slime mould, those behaviour they show mm. when they go through mazes? You know, what's going on with this emergence here? And, and here she is. Maybe by being together, they're better at detecting the vector that's passing by and attaching to it. Maybe they can survive this dangerous journey better together. And maybe once they get to new places, they can detect resources better as a group and have enough individuals to mate with in order to start a new colony. Having said all that, we don't actually know yet if towers are actually a product of active decision-making from all the individual worms even though the end product behaves like a superorganism that is dynamic and responsive and does things like bridging gaps and attaching to flies. The initial formation could still simply be emergent, meaning that it occurs in a decentralized way without overall coordination amongst the individuals. We still don't really know if and how worms are communicating and coordinating with each other in the superorganism form. The growth and the spatial exploration that you saw in the really tall lab-grown tower could actually just be from individual worms doing their own thing, trying to get up higher and exploring the space around until they collapse and get up again. But on the other hand, we also saw that the worms can wiggle as a bundle and actively respond to potential vectors as a whole tower. And this could potentially benefit from the concept of collective sensing. The idea here is that perhaps selected individuals are responding to the environment and transmitting information to the group as a whole. In this case, potentially through body movement and body contact with other worms. Imagine one worm senses an insect coming by and it starts to wiggle actively. This motion could then trigger nearby worms to start wiggling in phase and and then soon enough you end up with a whole tower actively waving together as a bundle and even growing towards the the direction of the insect. That is to say that the group then as a whole has an expanded sensory range by sharing social information and behaving as one superorganism. Isn't that amazing? A hyperworm with an extended sensory range. And it does make me think of um, these slime molds because, you know, they, those are single celled organisms that come together sometimes to form uh, an organism together. And that kind of gives us a clue about how multicellular organisms started. But that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about super organism, all these worms. And it's something, you know, this is, you know, one of the best known organisms on the planet. Mm. And yet we still discover this this whole new phenomenon about it. Yeah, so it's very it, cool. all of its neurons have been mapped. And that happened decades ago. We, we did know this organism really mm. well. So it's cool. Um, along with all of, you know, the other classic poster children, <laughs> <laughs> the fruit flies, zebrafish, Arabidopsis. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you got that in. Yeah, got to, <laughs> got to remember the plants. And so, well, Serena's been thinking about this too, and she wrote this paper called "Fantastic Beasts and How to Study Them." Um, and, and I think she's getting in her um, 
her thoughts on you know we might know these things really well in some in a lab sense but yeah. what's another way we can study them we encourage researchers to consider and integrate multiple aspects of ecological relevance into behavior research done in lab model organisms so that we can finally begin to appreciate our animal models more as fantastic beasts that have a life of their own and challenges of their own to solve and this gives us the incredible opportunity for a more integrated way of understanding animal behavior. Mm-hmm.